So uh, as you can tell, elephant in the room, this is not for meeting too many burritos. I am in fact pregnant, so perfect that I'm speaking on this topic today. Um, by show of hands, and hopefully I can see with the lights, how many of you have wondered if low carb is safe in pregnancy? Okay, looks like quite a few people in the room from what I can see. Um, how many of you feel like you have a good answer to that question? Less hands, okay, typical. So uh, no disclosures other than if you buy my books, I make money from that. So um, I'm a real food registered dietitian. This isn't an official term, it's just something that those of us who don't follow like food pyramid, super high grain recommendations tend to call ourselves. And I'm also a diabetes educator. Um, most of my career has actually been in prenatal nutrition and gestational diabetes in a lot of different arenas, um, running from public policy, clinical practice, research, consultant, speaking, and a lot of writing. I'd say most people know me from my work on gestational diabetes because I developed a different approach, and we'll talk about how my approach is different than the conventional approach for managing um, gestational diabetes. I've been lucky that um, the Czech Republic actually took note and they have revised their guidelines. They removed a mandatory minimum for carbohydrates for pregnancy. So that's huge, and I hope other countries will follow suit. Thank you. And then I'm also the co-founder of the Women's Health Nutrition Academy. Um, we offer continuing ed on women's health nutrition. So this is a huge topic to unpack in 30 minutes. Um, it's better unpacked in about 90 minutes, um, so I'll try to keep it focused on a few areas. So first is how metabolism changes in pregnancy. I think sometimes we set policies from this top-down approach without considering what's actually happening physiologically during pregnancy. We'll talk about the different types of ketosis and which ones might be safe or unsafe in pregnancy, and then talk a lot about epigenetics and fetal programming, specifically on the effects of excessive carbohydrate intake on pregnancy outcomes. So even though I'm a dietitian, I am not your typical cereal eating calorie counting dietitian. Um, that probably goes without saying, otherwise I wouldn't be on this stage. So when I first started working in the prenatal nutrition field, especially with gestational diabetes, I was working with you know, the California State um, Program on Gestational Diabetes called California Gestational Diabetes. California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program. Let's not mess that up. Um, and I was dumbfounded to hear a statistic that women with poorly controlled gestational diabetes have children who face a six-fold higher risk of developing obesity or type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. And we put so much emphasis on working on this childhood obesity issue and kind of you know, blaming the parents for giving bad food, blaming the kids for eating too much sugar, blaming them for not exercising enough. But what if there was something that metabolically happened, some fetal programming or epigenetic effects from the environment they were exposed to in utero that actually affects their lifetime metabolic risk? And that, in fact, is the case. And some studies have actually found that risk is not six-fold, but up to 19-fold higher. So this is an area where we can really make a difference. Two birds with one stone situation. So imagine my surprise when I started working in this field and found that the recommendation for pregnancy was to eat more carbohydrates. This is not different for people with gestational diabetes. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the new name for the American Dietetic Association. This comes directly from their policy paper on pregnancy nutrition. The sample meal plan is on the side, so just take a look at breakfast, for example, oatmeal, low-fat milk, strawberries. Anyways, this provides more than 300 grams of carbohydrates per day. And that's actually in like the mid-range of their carbohydrate recommendations. So when I first started using these recommendations, and you know, as a good dietitian, you follow the rules early on. There's all these worries about doing anything that's different than other people in your field or getting in trouble. And close to half of my patients required insulin or medication to manage their blood sugar in pregnancy. And sometimes their blood sugars actually got worse 
after they met with me. So I had to wonder, did they fail the diet or did diet therapy fail them? You can guess what, I, what conclusion I came to. Um, but this led me to go deep into the research of how these recommendations were set. Are they evidence-based? Is it truly harmful to go low-carb in pregnancy, as we're all told? Um, and that's the topic of my presentation today. So the standard recommendations for pregnancy are like the rest of the general public, 45 to 65% of your calories coming from carbohydrates. They recommend a minimum of no less than 175 grams per day. That is the number that's really harped upon in the gestational diabetes world, by the way. You will never see a sample meal plan from a conventional dietitian that has less than 175 grams per day. This is a uh, sample meal plan that a client shared with me. This was what her hospital um, gestational diabetes program gave her. So 227 grams of carbs per day, um, split up with 45 to 60 grams at lunch and dinner, and 30 grams of carbs at each snack. So you're just carb loading all day long. And note, there's three snacks, so this, you know, it really adds up. And they especially push this evening snack because they're afraid that you'll go into um, accelerated starvation overnight, which they think is a really uh, bad idea. So what was difficult about this for me is that I couldn't find where this magical 175 gram number came from. And when I'd look at the research studies, of course, trying to go back to all the peer reviewed stuff, the papers would just cite each other and never cite the source. So. I finally found my answer digging through this Institute of Medicine document from 2005 on macronutrients. And they start with an estimated average requirement of carbohydrates for all adults, by the way, so you can laugh at this, of 100 grams per day. They add on additional for the energy demand of pregnancy, which they believe is about 300 calories. And of course, you have to get that minimum of 45% of those from carbohydrates. And then they add in additional to account for the um, glucose used by the fetal brain, uh, which is about 33 grams, although depending on the study you're looking at, it's as low as 17 grams. Funny enough, as you dig further through this document, you see that it contradicts itself many, many times. This first quote many of you have seen before, uh, the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life is zero, provided that adequate amounts of fat and protein are consumed. Um, lovely, we have this built-in mechanism called gluconeogenesis so that we don't die when we don't have carbohydrates, and this also uh, continues during pregnancy. The big problem here is ketones. So these have generally been considered unsafe in pregnancy. How many of you heard that ketosis is unsafe in pregnancy? Okay, less hands because we're you know at a low carb conference. Um, but these two quotes come from you know conventional gestational diabetes uh, literature. Even if a woman is having high blood sugar, you're not supposed to cut back on carbohydrates. The answer is to give insulin or medication to treat it. They're worried about ketosis because they're worried that it will harm fetal development, specifically fetal brain development. And what's interesting about this is if you really dig into the literature, and you have to go back to like the 1960s when they started doing most of this research on ketosis and pregnancy, you find that it originated from a single study in 1969 where they measured urine ketones at a single time point in women upon admission to the hospital when they were in labor. And then they correlated that with childhood IQ. So first of all, women in labor are often like not able to eat, you kind of lose your appetite, you're not drinking as much, you're gonna have ketones in your urine. You just, almost all women go into ketosis and labor, so it's kind of meaningless. Urine ketones don't correlate with blood ketones, particularly in pregnancy, so again, meaningless. And of course, this is correlation, not causation, and follow-up studies did not corroborate um, those results. Interestingly, as you dip into what's actually happening during pregnancy physiologically, you see that there's a tendency to develop ketosis. Sometimes ketones go up two to three fold from baseline. For anybody who's been low carb or keto and has monitored ketones pre-pregnancy, 
and then gets pregnant, they notice that they slip into ketosis much easier, even at lower levels of less carbohydrate restriction, I, sh I should say. So if ketosis happens naturally in pregnancy, are our bodies dumb? Like, how would we have survived as a species in times of inadequate food or living at high latitudes where you naturally don't have as much carbohydrate availability because it just does not grow? Um, how would we have survived? How would we not all have brain-damaged children? Like, there has to be something going on here. So it's important to think about the different types of ketosis, and for a lot of you, this will be review. For clinicians who are new in this area, this might be completely new information because even in my training as a dietitian and a certified diabetes educator, that's like, you know, the gold standard of, of um, educators in, in diabetes care, they don't talk about this. They just assume ketosis means diabetic ketoacidosis and it's a medical emergency and the sky is falling. So nutritional ketosis is when your body burns primarily fat for fuel. Um, because the diet is limited in carbohydrates, but not energy. So you're eating enough food in the form of fat and protein, you're just not eating a ton of carbohydrates. In this state, your blood sugar remains normal. This is a natural state that pregnant women will go in and out of throughout pregnancy. Um, it's benign. It's nothing to worry about. You're eating enough calories, you're getting enough micronutrients, you're just not binging on carbohydrates. Starvation ketosis, on the other hand, and by the way, a lot of the studies trying to prove that ketosis is harmful are either looking at starvation ketosis in pregnancy or diabetic ketoacidosis. We don't have good data on nutritional ketosis in pregnancy. Um, in this state, your body is burn, burning primarily stored body fat for fuel because you're not eating enough. You are starving, and this is a bad idea in pregnancy because you're also not getting a number of essential nutrients, macro and micronutrients. We've known since at least the 70s that this is a problem. It alters the amount of amino acids in the amniotic fluid. If we look at the data from the Dutch famine study, we know that limiting the amount of food and thus nutrients that a woman is eating can have long-term metabolic consequences for their children. So not a good idea. Don't starve yourself in pregnancy. And then DKA is a very special situation in type one diabetics or insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes when you're not taking enough insulin, exogenous insulin, meaning not what your body produces, what you take in the form of like an insulin shot. Keep in mind, pregnancy is a natural, naturally hyperinsulinemic state. So by the end of pregnancy, a woman will produce two to three times the amount of insulin, maybe more depending on, depending on how many carbohydrates she's eating. Um, but DKA, DKA doesn't make sense in normal pregnancy in that context because you're not in a state of insulin deprivation. Um, in DKA, you see high levels of blood sugar, you see acidic blood pH, you see very, very high blood ketone levels that you're just not gonna see in somebody who's limiting their carbohydrate intake. This is known to be extremely unsafe in pregnancy. We have study after study, many of them dating from the 80s and 90s, showing that it can harm fetal brain development, essentially. The problem is when people assume that ketosis or a woman having ketones in her urine automatically means that she's in DKA, which is not true. The only way to prove somebody is in DKA is to measure their blood ketones, which they seem to never want to do, by the way. But a lot of pr practitioners get really concerned when they see urine ketones in pregnant women, and you're just you're gonna see that all the time and it's nothing to worry about. The only way to get rid of them is to eat massive quantities of carbohydrates and as I'll share later, that's not a good idea. So the point I wanna drive home here is that low level ketosis is normal compared to people who are not pregnant. Healthy pregnant women will naturally have higher blood ketone levels, particularly after not eating for a 12 to 18 hour period. Um, you even see, you know, three to four hours after a meal, elevated ketones in the range of like nutritional ketosis, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 um, millimoles per liter. It's nothing to worry about. That's naturally what the body does. As you get further along in pregnancy, ketosis is even more common. So again, why might this be happening? So we have to look back at what's happening with pregnancy metabolism. 
And I feel like there's this disconnect in the research where you have people who are talking about pregnancy physiology and then people talking about um, adverse pregnancy outcomes and they seem to not see the link between the two and get to extreme and strange conclusions that don't take into account normal pregnancy physiology. So in early pregnancy, your body's in an anabolic state. It wants to accrue maternal fat stores. Insulin resistance is naturally lower. If you work with type 1 diabetic women, you actually often see their insulin needs, meaning like the amount of exogenous insulin they're taking, trough at a point in the first trimester before it starts to climb to that double or triple um, levels later in pregnancy. You're less prone to ketosis in the first trimester unless you're really not able to eat much from nausea and food aversions, but usually people naturally are inclined to eat more carbs and then they're not in ketosis in the first trimester. In late pregnancy, your body switches to a catabolic state. This is true of all mammals, by the way, it's not just humans. You see higher insulin resistance, you see that your body's programmed to shunt as many nutrients to the baby because that's when the baby is growing very rapidly, meaning in terms of like putting on mass. And you also start breaking down maternal fat stores. So early in pregnancy, some women feel like they're really bloated or like I'm so pudgy and that's, that's naturally built into pregnancy metabolism. Later on, your body will start pulling from those maternal fat stores to send energy to babies. Um, you're also more prone to ketosis in this state, which makes sense since you're burning more fat. There's a lot of theories for higher ketone levels. Ironically, the first one is actually brain development because the fetal brain gets about 30% of its energy from ketones. Um, they're used to, to synthesize essential lip lipids for the brain. They're involved in myelin synthesis as well. Um, it could be to help with energy levels in late pregnancy because maternal generation of ATP comes almost exclusively from burning fats at that point. It could also be for, for infant survival because healthy infants are naturally born in ketosis and they stay in ketosis for at least the first month of life. I've seen some data showing that kids remain in a low level of ketosis till about age eight. Um, it's not as high as in infancy though. You see it peak around um, day two um, after birth, by the way. Another is that high blood sugar is risky. And of course, since a lot of my work is in gestational diabetes, this is something that I, I know a lot about. Um, we see a number of different birth defects more common in women who have high blood sugar, even if their blood sugar is below the diagnostic threshold for gestational diabetes, which is really important because like 50% of adults in the US have diabetes or prediabetes, mostly undiagnosed. And most of the GD that I would see was actually undiagnosed prediabetes. Um, you also see as you get to higher blood sugar levels, different risk for different malformations. You see um, one of the big ones I like to point out is the enlarged pancreas issue. So as babies grow, at a certain point in gestation, their body, their pancreas starts producing insulin. So if they're getting an input of high maternal blood sugar, their pancreas grows larger, produces more insulin, and they become more insulin resistant. And this is something that seems to follow them around for the rest of their life. At really high blood sugar levels, we're talking undiagnosed um, diabetes or really poorly managed type one or type two diabetes, you see a higher risk of uh, fetal loss or stillbirth. Again, as you look towards what's normal in pregnancy, you see blood sugar levels tend to trend about 20% lower than baseline. So if you've seen, um, you know, outside of pregnancy, the cutoff for hypoglycemia is less than 70 in conventional diabetes. Uh, in pregnancy, they actually lower that by 10 points. The HAPO study is something that was it's like a monumental study in the gestational diabetes world. It's the hyperglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome study. Over 25,000 women in nine different countries. And they tracked blood sugar, split it up by different categories of severity, and tracked specific outcomes. So you can see we have birth weight greater than the 90th percentile, or macrosomia, big baby, um, primary C-section, neonatal hypoglycemia, 
which happens in these babies who have been exposed to high blood sugar, because once you cut the cord, you cut off that sugar supply, their blood sugar tanks, but their insulin production is primed for continuous and high blood sugar exposure. Um, you also see they measured um, cord blood C-peptide. That's a measurement of fetal insulin production. So you can see across all categories, the risk of elevated blood sugar is continuous. And you see the lowest risks of adverse outcomes in people in category one who had fasting blood sugar less than 75 and one hour blood sugar, likely the peak blood sugar, less than 105. And that would be milligrams per deciliter for anybody who's from outside of the US. So the big issue here is fetal programming or epigenetics. How is this affecting the children's metabolism for the rest of their life? Um, high blood sugar impairs leptin regulation, methylation, that explains the higher risk of birth defects. It primes them for high insulin production and having an enlarged and dysfunctional pancreas, essentially. And you can track these outcomes all the way into the teens and early 20s. Women eating a high glycemic index diet in pregnancy are, have children who are at higher risk of metabolic syndrome at age 20. So the problem with high carb, and this is kind of review for everybody here because you're already in the low carb space, is that higher blood sugar is priming higher insulin levels and higher fat storage. So you have babies who are born larger with a higher percent body fat, and then they continue that trend throughout the rest of their life. Sugar especially, and the high glycemic carbohydrates are the worst ones, and this is a risk for childhood obesity, independent of a diagnosis of gestational diabetes and independent of maternal BMI. And I feel like a lot of research tries to blame it on those two diagnoses as if they're um, you know, the only times that you might need to worry about blood sugar, but this shows that even in women who don't necessarily have um, start their pregnancies at a higher weight, gain an excessive amount of weight, or have high blood sugar as diagnosed by a glucose tolerance test, they still um, run into these issues with their children. This is important because right now, two-thirds of women of reproductive age are overweight or obese. We have more women starting their pregnancy metabolically unhealthy. Gestational diabetes is by far the most common pregnancy complication, affecting up to 18% of pregnant women. Um, and I realize I didn't define gestational diabetes, but there's two ways to define it, which is either high blood sugar that first develops or is first recognized during pregnancy. And it can also be defined as carbohydrate intolerance, which I think is the most telling definition. You can't tolerate large amounts of carbohydrates without having high blood sugar. So why are we giving them a high carb diet? We know that for the risk of macrosomia or having a, a large baby with a high percent body fat, excess weight and excess blood sugar are by far the most common causes. We also have a lot of data, as I mentioned, on just the glycemic index of the diet being an issue. And we really need to put a stop to this crazy growing rate of childhood obesity and diabetes. We should not be diagnosing toddlers with type 2 diabetes. It's really, it's, it's not their fault. It's what they were exposed to throughout gestation and maybe even generations prior to that. So should we be eating so many carbohydrates? I really like to take an ancestral approach to nutrition. It seems we can learn a lot from other cultures, um, especially from hundreds of years and beyond. But this study was from modern li living hunter-gatherers across the globe, and they estimated the average um, calories coming from carbohydrates across all of them. And the average was 16 to 22% of carbs. So a quarter to half of what our conventional recommendations are. Um, you'll see as you go closer to the equator, you're going to eat more carbs. You have you know, tropical fruit. You have more things that are available to grow. As you go closer to the poles and the climate is more extreme and the growing season is a lot shorter, you have lower carb carbohydrate intake. And this just makes sense. Also, ancestral foods are less carbohydrate dense, meaning there's fewer carbohydrates in them compared to other micronutrients or fiber. They also tend to be a lot smaller, so you can see wild blueberries compared to um, conventional uh, blueberries that have been hybridized over the years to be bigger and sweeter. To put it into perspective, I know people sometimes want to argue about, like, should you measure percent of 
calories from carbohydrates or just look at grams of carbohydrates per day. I tend to like grams of carbohydrates per day because it's easier for people to put into context. But if we look at an average prenatal diet of 2,400 to 2,600 calories, you see the conventional recommendations are just crazy high carb, um, upwards of 420 grams per day. I don't know how anybody can maintain normal glucose tolerance with an intake that high. Um, Hunter-gatherer intake, on the other hand, you're looking at like in the 90s to less than 150 per day. And then as you get to extreme latitudes, you're looking at even less. You also have to consider the quality of carbohydrates that you're consuming and the micronutrients that might be in them. We see from multiple studies that the more high glycemic carbohydrates one consumes, so these are the ones that spike blood sugar really rapidly, like a bagel, anything made from white flour, refined grains, sugar. Um, we see that's correlated with inadequate micronutrient intake. And this just makes sense. The more white bread you eat, the less meat and eggs and spinach and blueberries you're eating. Um, we also see that diets high in grains just as a whole are linked to excess, excess birth weight. We also see better blood sugar control. So a lot of these studies on pregnancy specifically look at a low glycemic diet because it's considered unethical to test a low carbohydrate diet in pregnancy. So we have to do the best with the data that we have. But a low glycemic diet pretty much consistently shows benefits. In this um, top study from Diabetes Care, you see that a low glycemic diet can lower the chance that a woman with gestational diabetes requires insulin by 50%. And this is the same, about the same reduction in requiring insulin or medication that I saw in clinical practice as well. They thought that I was some sort of miracle worker, like I was like really good at counseling clients. They just liked me more than the other dietitian. No, it was just that I wasn't telling them that they had to eat tons and tons of carbs. We also see that we might be able to avoid or mitigate some of the insulin resistance that you see in late pregnancy by just not pumping the body full of high glycemic carbohydrates. And we may even be able to help avoid some diagnoses of gestational diabetes entirely. You also just have healthier children. So these two babies are macrosomic babies born to women with gestational diabetes. They often have a number of issues in addition to the high blood sugar, or the, rather neonatal hypoglycemia, low blood sugar at birth, um, the large size, there can be lung development issues, they often require a stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. But we can actually probably help avoid some of this if we don't give so many high glycemic carbohydrates. So is there an optimal carbohydrate intake? In practice, I see about 90 to 150 grams per day. This is total carbs. Some people in this room will think that's super high. Meanwhile, the conventional dietitians think that I'm crazy. <laughs> For me, the priority is meeting micronutrient needs and also looking at blood sugar regulation. And it's actually really rare for me to come across somebody who needs far less than 90 grams of total carbs per day. Moreover, as you keep going lower in that, it tends to, unless the woman's eating like mass amounts of leafy greens, you tend to end up with um, inadequate micronutrients. So I, I err on this side, but I think it can be customized lower or higher depending on the woman, as long as you're paying attention to your micronutrients. I also emphasize low glycemic carbs, and as I said, personalized to the client. I'm gonna go through this quick, I only have a few more. Some people assume that I am recommending no carbohydrates because I say low carb. You'll probably still eat carbohydrates um, if you're eating you know, leafy greens, berries, nuts and seeds, even you know, full fat Greek yogurt, you're still getting carbs. Most people just aren't adding up everything that's in their diet. The main goal here is just to eliminate refined grains, cut way back on sugar, and then as the person's tolerance is, you know, high carb foods in moderation. If they have gestational diabetes, definitely eat to the meter. I'm gonna go through this uh, pretty quickly, but a lot of the foods that provide the necessary micronutrients for pregnancy are naturally low carb. It's probably not by accident. This just shows a, you know, conventional Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics sample meal plan versus one of mine. 
on one of these, you'd just be starving and hangry all day, and one of them, you'd be satisfied and getting a lot more nutrient-dense foods. The questions for me that remain are, is there an optimal blood ketone level during pregnancy? This is so understudied, it is very disappointing. We don't have evidence that they should be, women should be striving for high ketone levels during pregnancy. So I think that's important to point out. But we do have a lot of evidence that the body physiologically manages the levels of ketones by excreting ex excess amounts in the urine and keeping blood ketone levels at a pretty safe range. But I'm, I'm not comfortable saying people should take exogenous ketones in pregnancy or that they should go to really extreme levels of carbohydrate restriction for the purpose of raising ketone levels. Also, we have to wonder about the first trimester. Anyone here who has been pregnant before, you know that most of the time you're not able to tolerate all of your favorite foods in the first trimester and you eat more carbohydrates naturally, um, especially if nausea and vomiting or food aversions are going on. You also see the higher insulin sensitivity, frequent hypoglycemia. It seems like it's maybe permissible to have more. You also see the thyroid change significantly early in the first trimester, ramping up hormone production by over 50%. So this all points to me that it's okay to have more carbs, at least in the first trimester. So to sum up, a nutrient-dense real food prenatal diet reduces risks for moms and babies. Um, carb needs will vary, but they are almost certainly lower than our conventional recommendations. Emphasize the most nutrient-dense carbohydrates possible and stop worrying about low-level ketosis. It's a natural phenomenon. You can learn more about me here. And this was my firstborn, and uh, I was low-carb for most of it, and he's exceeded all his milestones. So all the nonsense about <laughs> brain development being messed up certainly was not my N of 1 experience. Thank you.